tonight the twisted mind games that some people play, starting with one of the most terrifying stories of the last several months. It's when a young autistic boy was snatched off a bus to be used as a pawn so the kidnapper could get media attention for his crazy rants against the government. Elizabeth, as you know, we were right there as the boy was pulled from that bunker in Alabama. And today for the first time, Pierre Thomas with the stunning secret tapes, an ABC News exclusive. How that incredible FBI team matched wits with a madman. It makes you wonder who was really the cat and who was the mouse. It's 3.31 p.m. on a winter day in the tiny town of Midland City, Alabama. Population 2300. Kids are coming home from school. A bus is taking the same dirt road it always does, past cotton fields and mobile homes. But today, unbeknownst to anyone on board, they are being stalked. Suddenly, a man carrying a gun stops the bus, loaded with children, and makes an unthinkable demand. I need two boys to take care of us. But this is not just any man. This is Jimmy Lee Dykes, a man with a simmering grudge with a list of grievances against the U.S. government. Six, eight, nine, here you go. Now, I'm in. Right now. Right now. In this exclusive audio recorded by the bus security system, you hear the 65-year-old Dykes threatening to kidnap two of the 21 children on that bus. Two kids, six to eight years old. Get it. Get it. Make a move, I'll shoot For almost five minutes, bus driver Chuck Poland resists the man that up until now he thought was his friend. Can't do it. Do it! Sorry. You have to shoot I thought I was a kid. Please, do it. Do it. Do it. I don't kill you. It's my responsibility. I can't help that. Kids all the time. I can't help it. I can't turn them over to somebody else. Unrelenting, Dykes turns his attention to the children, now paralyzed with fear. Come here, kid. The two in the back say, you, the girl, and that boy right there. Come here. Dykes turns his attention to a little boy named Ethan, just five years old. Ethan has autism and always wants to sit behind his favorite driver. Poland pleads not Ethan and tries to save the boy, even with a gun staring in his face. In the back of the bus, 15-year-old Trey Watts pushes back his fear and calls 911. Tell me what the guy with the gun's doing again. He's asking for kids. He's asking for kids? Yes, ma'am. He's aiming the gun at the bus driver? Yes, ma'am. When driver Chuck Poland heroically refuses to hand over Ethan and the other children, Dyke shoots him five times in full view of the horrified kids. Oh my gosh, what's going on? The bus, the bus driver's there. Oh my gosh, hang in there, baby, hang in there. Just get down, get down. What's he doing now, honey? We took a kid, we took a kid. Is the bus driver still on the bus? Yes, he's dead. You just had a bus driver shot badly. Dykes leaves behind a note on the bus and drags Ethan to a nearby underground bunker when he's been building in his backyard for months. And he wants a hostage for one reason and one reason only, to help him deliver a warped anti-government message. And he's prepared. The bunker is constructed to hold a hostage and fortified to withstand an assault by police. And with that grim reality begins a frightening siege will span six days. News of a little boy underground with a madman has the country riveted. School bus hostage. A standoff is underway. A frightened five-year-old boy held hostage in an underground bunker. Breaking news right now. A dramatic hostage situation unfolding. But along with the nation's media and local police, also arriving, the best and brightest profilers, hostage negotiators, and tactical units from the FBI, assembling in this church down the street from the bunker to study the tapes you just heard, to learn everything they could about Dykes so they could talk him out of that bunker, and to plan a daring last-ditch rescue they hoped they would never have to try. For the first time, they're speaking exclusively to ABC News, giving a minute-by-minute -minute account of those harrowing days, the cat-and-mouse moves they made as they tried to negotiate with a deranged kidnapper who's already proven he's willing to kill. You know, for a good while up front, we didn't know what we were dealing with. Unclear. Molly Amina is one of the team members. We had the note that he left on the bus. We had a video of the assault on the school bus. And not much more. Uh, and as the hours passed, very slowly information sort of trickled in. And through all of that, the offender stayed perfectly on mission. 
And that told me a lot right there. It scared me. It also scares Special yeah, Agent Stephen Richardson, to, to the on scene sure commander. We thought Ethan was going to die. Dykes makes his first demand. He calls 911 and instructs police to find a slender PVC pipe sticking out of the ground. It's a breathing tube that is keeping Dykes and his tiny captive alive. But it's also a line of communication. Parking through that pipe, the hostage team, which includes top negotiator Sean Van Slyke, tries to soothe Dykes. We always say we can't control the subject's behavior or attitude, but we can control our own and project that calm demeanor. Our communication with Mr. Dykes continues. We are engaged with him around the clock. But who is this man? And what does he plan to do? By day two, the team has learned Dykes is a decorated veteran of the US Navy who served in Vietnam. He's gradually become a recluse, living in this trailer estranged from his family. In that letter he left on the bus, Dykes makes it known he's intent on doing two things, making the world aware of his anti-government grievances and then killing himself. Mr. Dykes just remained committed to his plan and that this was going to end only in his death. The team, by now talking to Dykes via cell phone, has developed a strategy that involves Ethan. You're also able to get food down there and, and medicine to Ethan. Part of our strategy from the negotiation standpoint was really try to reinforce that point with Mr. Dykes that he was responsible for Ethan's safety and going as far uh, working to craft a media message thanking him. The cat and mouse game now kicks into high gear. Though they won't reveal their tactics, investigators have a limited view of what's happening inside the bunker. They know when Ethan is sleeping. They know Dykes has a large supply of food and water. And they know he's watching television. So negotiators use the media to try to manipulate his feelings so Dykes sees Ethan as someone's little boy. I want to thank him for taking care of our child. Police say Ethan remains calm in the bunker, playing with coloring books and toy cars sent down to keep him occupied. By day three, still no breakthrough. It's your old boy named Ethan. The community begins a nonstop prayer vision. Even tonight, that God would intervene. But in the command center, the team is hopeful. It was encouraging that the dialogue remained open. We were allowing him to vent towards us instead of towards Ethan. And perhaps most importantly in this situation, we were able to gather valuable tactical intelligence like details about the bunker in which Dykes is holding Ethan hostage. It is buried 12 feet down, six by eight, about the size of a parking space. These are photos of inside the bunker seen here for the first time ever. It has ventilation, electricity, and bunk beds. But more chillingly, the team discovers the bunker is rigged with explosives. That plastic pipe through which negotiators had originally been talking to Dykes, there's a bomb in it. He had the knowledge and the sophistication to build a device that could not only kill himself and, and the little boy, but could kill us as first responders and bomb technicians. Sheriff Wally Olson shows us how close his officers were to death. They would have to get up to the pipe and talk into the pipe. So, I mean, they were, they were on top of the pipe mm. that he could have detonated the bomb at any time. And even more sobering was the method by which Dykes was determined to deliver his twisted message. His intent was to have a female reporter down there with him and that she would hold his hand. Uh, well, in fact, he got his final message out to the world uh, and then committed suicide in her presence. That was never going to happen. We're, we're not in the business of endangering more lives.